Hi, guys. Welcome to the How I Raised It podcast, the show where we get an inside, real look at how founders raise capital for their businesses. I'm your host, Nathan Beckert, and today's episode is with Billy Thalhammer of Regent, developers of the Sea Glider, an all-electric cross between a boat and an airplane that uses wing and ground effect to fly just above the water's surface really efficiently, similar to the way seagulls coast just above the water. Really cool physics involved here. Billy recently raised a $60 million Series A to build out his fleet. So we talk about how to raise capital for a new blue ocean category. If you're tuning into this podcast to learn how to raise capital for your business, I've created a super valuable free welcome package for you. It includes a list of 2,500 investors who don't require a warm intro, plus 200 questions that investors are going to ask you. So it's really going to help you get ready to raise capital. To get instant access to this, please click the link in the first comment. And while you're there, please leave us a nice comment, what you like about this episode or this series in general. Really appreciate that. Last but not least, if you enjoy this conversation and think someone else would too, please share it with them and hit that subscribe button to get all our latest episodes. Thank you. Now sit back and enjoy this chat with Billy. Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today I have Billy Tallheimer of Regent Craft uh, coming to us from, where are you located? Uh, we are in Rhode Island, or as I like to call it, the Silicon Valley of the East. <laughs> Rhode of Island, the Ocean State. <laughs> Cool, cool, cool. Great. I haven't spent too much time over there, but it's a, it's a nice area. I like it. Um, lovely. Well, let's go right to it. What is Regent Craft? Yeah, so uh, Regent builds sea gliders. Sea gliders are a new mode of transportation, sort of a hybrid between a boat and a plane uh, that gives all electric high speed transportation on regional routes. Uh, so think of routes like Boston to New York or L.A. to San Francisco, uh, around the Hawaiian Islands or even internationally, New Zealand, Mediterranean, Japan. Uh, places like this, obviously, huge populations of people live by the coast. It turns out 40 percent of the world lives in these coastal communities. Uh, and we move them with a vehicle that can go 180 miles at 180 miles an hour and is totally powered uh, by batteries. So zero operational emissions and about half the cost of airplanes today. Very interesting. So define a sea glider. What is it? What is a sea glider? Yeah, so a sea glider is a, a type of vehicle known as a wing in ground effect vehicle, uh, WIG or WIG. Uh, so WIGs uh, look like aircraft. They fly, uh, but they fly within a wingspan of the surface. So uh, they fly in this aerodynamic regime called ground effect, which is this dynamic cushion of air. It's the same things that you see pelicans flying on as they fly over the surface. Uh, or that you experience sort of if you think about your last bumpy landing in a commercial plane ride, you're sort of bumping all the way in. But once you get over the runway, those bumps settle away, the engine spool down and you sort of coast over the ground for a second or two before you touch down. That's also ground effect. So sea gliders do dock to dock over water transportation and always fly within a wingspan of the surface of the water. So they're flying on that cushion of air like a pelican. Uh, and in so doing, we get tremendous range out of our battery systems, about twice as far as some of the electric aircraft uh, concepts that are out there right now. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I actually, uh, I know about wing and ground effect. I did a project like years ago. I wrote a business plan for a startup building. And this is this is like 15 years ago. So <laughs> I learned all about it and it was like fascinating. And I still don't fully understand how... T tell me if you can explain the physics effect of why there's this cushion of air as you're close to the water. I explain it like you would explain it to my my seven year old. <laughs> awesome. No, I got a, a really simple understanding ground effect. So, you know, how does lift work? You have this wing, there's high pressure beneath the wing that pushes up and then there's low pressure above the wing that sucks up and that, you know, pushes the, the airplane up. But you can sort of picture that high pressure air under the wing, pushing the plane up, providing lift. Uh, you know, equal and opposite reactions and all that. So that high pressure air needs something below it to push on as well, to push that plane up. Uh, and it is more efficient to push on a hard surface like the ground or the surface of water than it is to just push on more air, which is what airplanes do, right? That high pressure just pushes on more air beneath it. Uh, so when you're flying in the ground effect, that high pressure uh, is almost uh, pocketed and contained. Think of uh, almost like a hovercraft, but without a skirt, but the same sort of effect. 
uh, you get to sort of contain that high pressure air underneath the vehicle and therefore you augment your lift or you decrease your drag. Uh, any way you cut it, you increase your flight efficiency, which gives you longer range. Yeah, that's really cool. I think using the Pelican uh, example is perfect, right? I go out sailing and you see these these guys just skimming a couple feet or so off the water for and barely flapping the wings. It's really quite a phenomena, you know? Very cool. Um, okay, so let's get into just a few more bits about the business. Um, this will how many passengers can these uh, vehicles carry? This region's working on two Sea Glider products. The first is a 12 passenger vehicle called Viceroy. I will bring that to service within the next couple of years. Uh, but it turns out that this ground effect technology scales very well. So uh, after the Viceroy 12 seater, we'll move on to a hundred seat Sea Glider called Monarch. Uh, with uh, expected entry to service before the end of the decade. Very cool. And what were your where were your first routes be? So we have customers all over the world. We actually have over eight billion dollars uh, in orders from our commercial customers. Uh, we recently announced that sort of that that very first Sea Glider uh, is an order holder uh, called Southern Airways Express. I recently did a merger with Surfair, and they operate as Mokulele Airlines. Uh, in Hawaii, so that Southern Airways Express Mokulele contingent has the the order of firm deposit uh, on the first Sea Glider, uh, and we're working with them to explore exactly where that first route would be. You know, today Southern Airways operates on the east coast of the U.S. Uh, and Mokulele operates in Hawaii, so we're we're looking to where, where they're operating today in those familiar coastlines for first operations. Very cool. And is there? You know, there's this physical effect called wing and ground effect, but is there something you guys have invented or patented around that? Or are you just basically the first to really commercialize and build build uh, uh, gliders for, for this market? Yeah, well, it, it's a great question. And, you know, this wing and ground technology actually goes back to the 1960s uh, because all the cool stuff in aerospace was already invented and, and attempted in the 1960s right so um you know not surprised i mean super cool that you have done a wig project and business plan before um but to some extent not not surprised you know this concept has sort of been dusted off every decade or so since the 60s uh, and has really never been commercially viable uh, and I, I'm not sure why you specifically found it wasn't commercially viable, but as we were doing our research, we found in many cases, uh, it was because of the poor wave tolerance. So not only wigs of wing and ground effect craft, but really any flying machine that takes off from the water. So seaplanes and flying boats included. You're taking off on, on planing holes, which are slapping the surface as you come up to speed. Uh, sort of at best, it's uncomfortable. At worst, you can't operate at all. Uh, and it was critical to us in developing a new mode of transportation that it was reliable and high utilization. If I'm going to book a family trip to Hawaii, I'm going to book it on a mode of transportation that I know will operate during my vacation. Uh, if I'm going to plan a, a critical military mission, uh, I need to do it with vehicles that I know will be operational. So tackling that wave tolerance was really the key unlock in, in what differentiates sea gliders uh, from wing and ground craft and, and even flying boats and seaplanes of the past. Uh, so we used uh, hydrofoils to unlock that wave tolerance. So sea gliders are the first wave tolerant wigs that they are the first hydrofoiling wigs. Sea gliders float, foil, and fly. Uh, so you board them at the dock like you would a, a ferry. Uh, and then really the, this magic happens and this differentiation happens as you go through the harbor environment or river environment when you're up on your hydrofoils. Uh, so these hydrofoils are extendable. You're on struts about six feet tall, which gives you six feet of wave tolerance. You're still a maneuverable boat. Maneuverable boat. You're basically a hydrofoil ferry. Uh, and then once you leave that harbor and you get into the open water now, that's when you take off onto the wing. So you go directly from the hydrofoils to the wing. Uh, that is the unlock that we have combined the wave tolerance and maneuverability of a hydrofoil with the high speed and, and therefore, you know, regional access of a, of a wing of an airborne flying machine. Uh, the technical hard part is that hydrofoiling fast is very difficult. Water is a thousand times more dense than air uh, and flying slow is difficult. And so for the first time with the sea glider design, we've been able to overlap those two regimes and go directly from foil to flight. Very cool. So uh, I want to get into fundraising and, uh, but what was your background? How did you come up with this idea? What's the backstory? Yeah, so I'm a I'm an aerospace engineer uh, by education. I was uh, undergrad and grad at MIT uh, with my co-founder Mike. I was focused on 
uh, sort of advanced aircraft design and flight physics, and he was doing flight controls and autonomy work. So between the two of us, we could build an airplane. Um, spent a lot of time at a Boeing subsidiary called Aurora Flight Sciences working on electric aviation. So we we're both very familiar with the technology, but also intimately familiar with the headaches. You know, the, the cost and duration of aviation certification programs, the limited range of existing battery technologies. Uh, and so as I sort of progressed through my career from engineer to program management to business development, uh, also, as I uh, started flying myself and became a pilot, now an aerobatic pilot, I had this great opportunity to see this new space of electric aviation from the lenses of an engineer and a program manager, a business developer, and a pilot. And so there's a lot of goodness here, you know, electrifying aviation, uh, services a sustainable mission, which is becoming existential, drastically reduces cost, reduces noise, increases uh, reliability and redundancy, and therefore safety. Uh, but we have these big problems, uh, and what we realize is we could solve it in the maritime domain. So that's sort of we we weren't necessarily you know serial entrepreneurs coming to this from the venture space. Actually, a lot of this was new for us. Uh, but what we did know very well. Uh, was how to build uh, airplanes, uh, how to power and control them with, with electric uh, propulsion and digital flight controls technology, uh, and how to manage programs on, on you know, human flown flying machines. Very, very cool. Um, <clears throat> excellent stuff. So let's get into the fundraising. How much have you guys raised and over how many rounds? Yeah, so we actually just completed uh, what we called our Series A. It was a $60 million raise. Takes us uh, up to about $90 million total raise since inception, uh, which was uh, November of 2020. So uh, in, in under three years here, we've been able to raise uh, just about $90 million. Congrats. Um, I guess let's go, let's go chronologically. So, you know, you have this concept, you're, you've got the background, you know how to build planes, and you've got this wacky idea of combining hydrofoils and wing ground. Sorry, it's not wacky. It's actually really cool. Um, it was wacky at the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how how did you get this financed off the ground to begin with? Because it is, you know, kind of an out there idea. I mean, it's really cool. But yeah, what was the first funding come from? Yeah, so we, we uh, you know, had a, enough of a concept where we're like, Hey, uh, electrification could work in other domains. Uh, you know, we we think there's a market, um, and we basically presented this to our fiancés at the time, now wives, and they're like, "Yeah, you know, go ahead. Uh, we think you should quit your job so you can start actually developing this. You know, not violate any employment agreements. You know, do it on your own as, as a startup." Uh, but they were quick to to set terms on this, uh, so we had five months to have income again. You know, we could go five months without a salary, uh, which meant that, uh, and the additional term was, if we did not have, uh, if we had not raised money by three months, then we had to start applying to sort of normal jobs again. So that that was the clock. So as soon as we quit, you know, not only were we foregoing salary, uh, but we had, we had this clock put on us by the most important people in our lives. So uh, we're off to the races. That's hilarious. My wife, gave me something like that, but I kept getting extensions. And I think I got about, about two years of extensions <laughs> before <laughs> I started paying myself. So congrats on, on making it happen in such a strict, uh, strict timeline. <laughs> so, yes. so, so we, we around or, uh, you got into Y Combinator was that the first kind of capital? Product? Yeah. So, you know, we, we sort of went off on our own. We, we, uh, Knew of Y Combinator because uh, my co-founder, Mike, was the first employee at a Y Combinator back startup previously uh, that was doing sort of agricultural drones. He was familiar a little bit with the concept, but hadn't gone through the program himself. Um, so we built a pitch deck and a business model and all that, started shopping it around to our friends who were in that venture ecosystem. Uh, and they basically said, hey, you should apply for Y Combinator. Uh, and we said, well, we missed the deadline already. And they said, don't worry about it. You know, if you're if you're good enough, you'll get in. So write a really, really good application. Um, so that's what we did. And again, we, we sent this application to everyone and just had them, you know, tear us apart. Uh, came out with something we thought was pretty good, sent it to Y Combinator. And, and indeed, uh, we we ended up getting in late. But the, the story of actually how we got in was was pretty funny because, um, you know, you, you find out you're you're eligible after the application to the interview, but that that interview is sort of the, the key gate 
step. And so it was uh, in December, you know, we, we left in, left our jobs in November at our five month clock. So this is now December that we were applying for Y Combinator. We had our interview with Y Combinator, which is a 10 minute interview uh, remote because we were in the age of COVID. Uh, and we, we heard they get back to you the same day if you get in. Uh, it also happened to be Mike, my co-founder's birthday. So we were at a birthday and we were having drinks and there's no call. Okay, have another drink. Uh, still no call. Okay, time for another drink then. And so this birthday celebration started to be a little bit of mourning that we didn't get into Y Combinator. And sure enough, on the taxi ride home, now several drinks in, uh, we get the call from a California number that was Y Combinator saying, you know, are, are you into the program? And I had to do everything I could to, to sound, you know, completely sober on this call to say, yes, we are in. But uh, it was an exciting place to start. So by the time, uh, you know, really by January, when that uh, Winter 21 Y Combinator program started, we had had funding. We had coupled that Y Combinator funds with a few friends and family uh, in the network uh, and, uh, you know, met our uh, wise's constraints of uh, getting funding within five months. Very cool. Um, and then you raised some money from Mark Cuban. Did you uh, how, tell me the story of that? Yeah. yeah. So um, Mark was one of our first investors. Uh, we were not on Shark Tank, though it sort of felt like it at times. Um, so one of my uh, internships was at Blue Origin, uh, the you know, sp- uh, Jeff Bezos's space company. And my roommate in the internship program uh, turned out to be one of the co-founders of Relativity Space that is now a a unicorn 3D printing rockets. Uh, And so you kept them in the network and we stayed in touch and we started going down this. We said, hey guys, like we're in a Y Combinator actually. Uh, One of them, Jordan Noon, who was my roommate, uh, turned out to be one of our early angel investors as well, which was super cool Um, when you sort of have this, you know, friend network and and even from former internships grow into these, you know, great business opportunities. Uh, But he said, look, when when we, when Relativity was going through this process, we just guessed Mark's email, we sent him a cold call uh, and we got him to invest in us. We'll save you that effort of guessing his email. We'll give you his email, but... Uh, you know, you have to write a really good cold call email because we can't do anything else. We'll just share the email. So um, we spent a lot of time working through this email, you know, great like subject line. We put a sea glider up there with a Mavericks logo on it, all this stuff. Uh, it was probably Sunday night, you know, 11 p.m. Or, or so getting ready for the week. We send the email to Mark within 10 minutes. Mark responds, you know, make me an offer. And uh, I think Mike had gone to bed or something at the time. I call him up, you know, Mark's emailing, let's go back to the computers. And so we're writing up the follow-up email. Uh, and this process goes on for about a week of 11 p.m. We're checking in because we we're on Easter time. He's on Central time. Checking in. We probably get one or two emails back and forth with Mark. So what are we negotiating tonight? So we pre-write all of our, you know, emails and negotiations during the day and then negotiate with Mark in two emails at night. And his answers were always just, you know, one line or something. So you gotta be quick. Um, but by the end of the week, as we were going through the Y Combinator program here too, so we had that momentum. Uh, sure enough, we, we closed the deal with Mark uh, and that actually ended up uh, by demo day at the end of the Y Combinator program, we'd already raised our $6 million target that we wanted to do to build a Sea Glider prototype and ended up oversubscribing to about nine and a half million in that, in that initial round. That's amazing. Did you did you get on the phone with Mark or was this all over email back and forth? It was all over email. So most of my network was saying like, this isn't Mark. This is someone that Mark pays. Uh, and then we did have one, there was one call uh, and with Mark and Mark's lawyers as we we're you know, negotiating terms of, of the note here. And our lawyers said, don't get on the call. I don't expect Mark's going to go. I think it's just going to be lawyers versus lawyers. And we want to save you. If they ever get mad at us, you can sort of come in and save the day and, and save the deal. So, you know, don't, don't like, don't join this call and don't involve yourself. And sure enough, Mark was on that call and I wasn't. So I, I felt bad that I missed Mark, but I will give Mark a lot of credit in that actually last year, uh, he did a, about an hour long Zoom call with our interns and our and our whole company as sort of like a lunch and learn. And, and our interns just got to pepper him with questions. And it was it was really great. So we, we have talked on the phone and actually on Zoom with Mark since. That's really cool. And, and I don't want to get too trapped in this one one thing, but like what were the during that week of negotiation? What was it? Um, what are the the pressure points that he really focuses on like i guess maybe the question is if someone else was also going to engage with mark what 
kind of things should they prepare for? Yeah. Um, Mark asked us to make him a deal and we thought we were pretty clever initially. We said, we'll give him a first sea glider off the line. We'll paint it in Maverick's livery. We'll deliver it to his house. We'll teach him how to fly it. Uh, and he basically came back to us and said, you know, no, a deal with money, you know, let's <laughs> talk valuation. So, uh, you know, that was, that was pretty sobering. Um, there was definitely discussion about valuation, uh, about uh, sort of his value above and beyond the investment and how involved he'd be in the company, whether from advisory or sort of marketing and sort of name brands. Mm. Uh, we're in that early stage, obviously, valuation is super squishy. So it's a lot of just thumb in the air. What do we think this is worth negotiating on, on the valuation? Uh, and then there are also some terms uh, you know, in the early stage or the the primary ways that that most companies raise before their first price round is through a, a safe or a convertible note. Uh, and, and Mark was definitely uh, more interested in the convertible note. So mm -hmm. there's just more terms to walk through in, in a convertible note specifically. I think because of the, you know, his experience and the volume of transactions he does, uh, you know, he, he definitely had the leverage on us with the note. <laughs> That's interesting. So, so a lot on on terms, valuation, things like that. It's you know basically business deal, not so much on the tech or, I mean, the market. I guess did he get into that stuff too, or is it more just like, hey, you're in YC. I believe they've you know they've probably um, verified the tech and stuff like that. So let's work on terms. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think you know he he sort of diligenced us. Uh, certainly, we we had to pass his sniff test, and and we had a few questions back and forth in the email. But also, he went to his network, which was sort of useful for us because we were you know friends and had been diligenced by the the technical you know founders of Relativity that sort of helped us get introduced in the first place. Oh, there yeah. was there was good feedback there to Mark. Obviously, they they would not have stuck their neck out. To one of their largest uh, early investors, without us having, you know, the, the technical uh, competence uh, on both the vehicle and the and the business model, um, but that ended up sort of working well as Mark Mark used his network to diligence us because it was, you know, it's it's a aerospace and maritime technology that wasn't necessarily his core competency. Yeah, I want to keep moving real quick. I see uh, in a I, I'm not sure what round this was, but. Um, Teal Capital, which is Peter Teal's um, fund, led around. Uh, how'd you put that together? Is there any story behind that? Yeah, so um, our one of our first, uh, sort of the, the leader of the safe round out of uh, Y Combinator was Founders Fund. Uh, so we already had some aspect of, you know, Teal connectivity, but actually Teal Capital makes, is, you know, a separate entity, makes decisions separately. Um, and actually was was one of the last checks to invest in that Y Combinator round. So we we're introduced to both Founders Fund and Teal Capital through the Y Combinator demo day, uh, which you know just speaks to the the reach of a of a YC demo day and the YC network. It was absolutely you know credit YC with getting us off the ground and and having such a successful initial raise with really just a concept. Um, so Teal Capital was was relatively small in that first round and then came back in a big way. Uh, in our first price round uh, in December of 21, ended up leading the round, co-leading with with Jam Fund. Uh, so it's Justin Mateen, uh, and then uh, Founders Fund. You know, participated there, and almost since then, they've they've almost been switching rounds. You know, with the uh, Teal Cap going in bigger, and then Founders Fund going in bigger. Uh, so it's it's been cool to see uh, you know two parts of sort of the the overall Teal umbrella, but but playing differently. And who led the most recent round? Did you tell me that already? I can't remember. Uh, so leader of the of our Series A of the sixty million dollars Series A is eighty ninety Industries. Okay. Uh, newcomer on our cap table, um, awesome fund. They have they have two focuses. One is sustainability. One's aerospace and defense, and we're we're right at the intersection there. Uh, so uh, Karam and Ryan and and Wes and team over there uh, are deeply involved in this space. I uh, recently ranked one of the top uh, early investors uh, by by several of the ranking groups uh, and have deep connectivity to um, some some large industrials. You know, one of their uh, you know, anchor LPs and backers are the founders of Sierra Nevada Corporation, uh, the aerospace company mm -hmm. uh, you know, recently spun out Sierra Space. Uh, so just a, a great network in, in both sort of the industrial side and the, the defense side. Very cool. And strategic investors, I guess, is that, um, I guess, why why have you gone into the strategic investor route so soon? 
Yeah. yeah, I think you know two reasons. Uh, one is that it's it's beneficial to the business. There's there's so much we have to do when we talk about becoming a Sea Glider OEM, a Sea Glider manufacturer. We have to build the thing. The thing includes all these different subsystems. So within a Sea Glider are motors and batteries and flight computers and actuators and sensors, uh, composite structure. Then we need to integrate those all together. Then we need to ship them places. Then we need to uh, train people on how to use them. We need to maintain the vehicles uh, you know, as they're sort of aging. Uh, and so there's so much to do there that uh, forming strong relationships with uh, uh, industrials and strategics along the supply chain and along the operational chain to potential future customers is, is super important for us to get sort of the scale and global reach that we need to really generate those investors returns because we're, you know, we, we don't hide it. We're a capital intensive startup building hardware, building, you know, human safe flying machines. Uh, so we really need global scale uh, and distribution to to enable those venture returns. Uh, so we've we've formed some great strategic partnerships on both the commercial and defense side. On the commercial side, uh, Japan Airlines, Hawaiian Airlines, Mesa Airlines, uh, Yamato, which is the the largest uh, parcel delivery uh, company in Japan, uh, all strategic investors. Uh, and then on the defense side, Lockheed Martin uh, invested recently as well. Yeah. Um, so we, we've had some really great partnerships there. The, the other reason for you know taking on strategic capital and, and going after the CVCs uh, is really just as we're seeing the, the fundraising environment change, uh, you know we're seeing sort of less funds being deployed, certainly now in the 2022, 2023 space as compared to 2020 and 2021. Um, we're seeing uh, sort of uh, less risk appetite as it pertains to capital intensive, you know, pre-revenue hardware companies, which which we are and we don't hide it. But again, some companies are, or some investors are looking for, uh, you know, capital efficient SaaS early, you know, exit early uh, timeline to returns. Uh, but where we have seen, you know, still strong conviction is in the strategics. Mm, interesting. Very interesting. Okay. I won't keep too much longer, but any uh, last tips, tactics you would share with other maybe hardware intensive uh founders you know if you were advising and mentoring a, a fellow founder what would you tell them yeah um you know as a as an engineer uh sometimes it's it's almost disappointing uh on sort of the the not the lack but the sort of a acceptance of the technical rigor of what we're doing. Like mm -hmm. there is an immense amount of technical rigor in what we're doing, an immense amount of work and investment. We have an absolutely world-class engineering team. And I want to brag about that and cry from the hilltops. And I do, uh, but to some extent, you know, some of these investors look at our team, look at our tech, you know, go through the slide deck. I'm like, great, You're like this makes sense. I believe you can do it. It's physically possible. Uh, you, you have a good IP mode. Uh, let's talk about the business, right? And I think especially for sort of technical founders uh, and certainly for, for hard tech founders, when you're talking about more decade returns and you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars to raise rather than tens of millions, uh, you really sort of need to get it through your head that uh, this is a business, right? You need to show how you're making money, how this translates to a business. You need to show what the sort of uh, exit potentials are and the multiples you can deliver to these investors. Uh, so, you know, my hat that I wear as CEO is that outwards facing fundraising and business development side where, where this isn't a business. Uh, and we happen to make really cool uh, maritime flying machines called sea gliders. Uh, and there is, again, an immense amount of really interesting, really cool tech in that. Uh, but to some extent, you know, I need to simplify that and brag about how much money we're going to make and how successful we're going to be. And, and you know, the, the incredible returns we're going to deliver to our investors rather than, you know, how cool our, our electric propulsion system is. <laughs> yeah, right. How cool the tech is. Very cool. Really cool stuff. If people want to learn more, it's re regentcraft.com, correct? Um, yep. And will these be made in Rhode Island or where are you going to manufacture now these? Now we're, we're designing, developing, building, and shipping them out of Rhode Island here. So it's, cool. it's a, been a great spot for us to build. We're opening up our uh, 200,000 square foot manufacturing facility soon. And uh, Narragansett Bay is a, a great place to test sea gliders. Sure, of course. Okay, last question. When will we see this? When when will the first commercial uh, uh, flight, uh, yeah. call it a flight? I don't even know, do you call it? Yeah, a yeah, call it, call it a flight, call it a voyage. Uh, we're we're uh, 
we're starting uh, C trials on our full scale prototype next year, actually next summer. And so by the end of next year, planning on flying humans on board and then uh, right around from there, uh, we'll spool up our manufacturing and, and get those first product that 12 seat Viceroy sea gliders to market within the next couple of years. Really cool. I can't wait to see this. It's uh, it's really cool stuff. I'm a, I'm a sailor and, and it, it's really cool what you're doing. So I like it a lot. That's why I wanted to have you on the show. Um, Billy, thank you very much and uh, good luck. And hopefully we'll see this in the San Francisco Bay before too long. And uh, uh, maybe we'll catch you after your next round. Absolutely. Nathan, thanks so much for having me. All right. Over now. Thank you.